Well, good morning and welcome to the Antipodes webinar, where today we're going to discuss global equities and why it's prudent to be aware of paying up for growth when headwinds are compounding. My name's Mark Cormack and I'm a director with Pinnacle Investment. Pinnacle are equity partners and work alongside Antipodes to distribute the Antipodes Global and Asian Funds and the listed equity vehicles of Antipodes with our active ETF AGX1 and the Antipodes listed investment company to the Australian Financial Advisory Marketplace. And today I'm absolutely delighted to have Alison Savas here who's the Client Portfolio Manager at Antipodes. The last 12 months has certainly been an interesting time for global equity investing with both the US 10-year bond and US equity markets rising and falling. And you've witnessed the biggest rally in US equities since 1935 in the January and February periods after one of the largest market sell-offs we witnessed at the end of last year. So have these headwinds that were prevalent in 2018 disappeared? Today, Alison will take you through Antipodes' view on global equities. Just in terms of background, Antipodes was established in 2015 and has grown to encompass over 20 investment professionals with offices both in Sydney and London, which provides Antipodes with increased global company access and 24-hour trading. So what makes Antipodes different? Well, firstly, Antipodes aims to outperform the global equity market at lower levels of risk. And they do this by building high conviction, unconstrained, concentrated portfolios. Antipodes uses three levers in their global and Asian long short funds by investing long, they can short indexes and stocks, and they actively manage the currency and not just hedge back to Australian dollars. And the outcome from a portfolio perspective has been that Antipodes has had a net exposure to the market that's ranged between 60 and 65% since inception. And for those investors who prefer a fuller equity market exposure, Antipodes also manages the global long only fund and the active ETF, which adopts the same investment process without shorting. So turning to today's webinar, the Antipodes presentation will last around 15 to 20 minutes and that'll be followed by a Q&A. So all attendees have the opportunities to ask questions via the internet and this can be done by clicking the questions tab on your screen. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Antipodes Client Portfolio Manager, Alison Savas, for today's presentation. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Mark, and welcome to everybody who has joined us today. Before we get into a discussion about performance, outlook and positioning, let's start with a brief overview of who Antipodes is and what we do. Antipodes is a pragmatic value manager. So a typical value manager will wed to low multiple stocks with an expectation of mean reversion. We think this approach could miss structural change in an industry and therefore risks being stuck with the classic value trap. Instead, at Antipodes, we seek to own good quality businesses, businesses with multiple ways of winning, but important, importantly, buying them at the right price. Bringing this together is portfolio construction. Many managers will say that they own 60 or 70, 70 stocks across a variety of sectors, and so they are diversified. But what this misses is the degree of correlation between individual names. So you won't realise how correlated your portfolio is until it's too late. At Antipodes, we don't think about our portfolio as a list of stocks, rather we think about it as a series of clusters. We seek diversification between the clusters to generate uncorrelated sources of alpha, and we limit the size of each cluster to minimise our exposure to unforeseen risk. And what we end up with is an eclectic portfolio which won't look like the benchmark and it won't look like our peers, but it seems to generate returns in excess of the benchmark over a three to five year period with below market levels of risk. For the 12 months to March 2019, the Antipodes Global Fund delivered a positive return of 1.9% but lagged the benchmark of 10.8%. Now over the past 12 months, cyclicals underperformed as concerns around tighter monetary policy gripped markets, compounded by protectionist and populist rhetoric. So while the Global Fund has lagged the benchmark for the last 12 months, the underperformance has largely occurred in the first quarter of 2019. So it is somewhat helpful to think about returns in the context of calendar 2018 and then the three months to March 2019. So in calendar 2018, the Global Fund returned 2.7% relative to the benchmark of 1.5%. 
So this alpha of 1.2% was largely driven by our shorts, which were key contributors of performance when volatility emerged in the fourth quarter. Now turning to the first quarter of 19, the Global Fund has generated a positive return but has lagged the rally in global equities, notably the significant rebound in the US stock market, which rose over 13% in US dollar terms over the period. Now Mark alluded to this in his intro, but to provide some context, the US has experienced the weakest December since 1931 and the strongest January and February since 1935, which just highlights how unusual recent market moves have been. But let's break this down further. So our underweight positioning in the US has been a drag on performance. So while we have 30% gross exposure to the US stock market, on a net basis it's closer to 15%. The majority of our shorts are in the US. Now with policy turning more dovish at the beginning of the year, the market has extrapolated more of the same. That is a preference for structural growth or quality but at any price. The sharp bounce since December has been led by stocks offering strong near-term growth momentum as measured by forward sales growth. And this has been irrespective of valuation or balance sheet quality. Many of our shorts are in this part of the market where the market has very high expectations of forward sales but where we view the business models to be weak. So that is, we, don't see, we see no ways of winning. But yet the market has priced these companies to perfection so we don't see any margin of safety. Now these stocks were hit the hardest in fourth quarter 18 and this is when our shorts shone and generated alpha but have subsequently rebounded the hardest in first quarter of 19 and they have cost us. Key contributors to first quarter 19 performance however were our cyclical exposures such as GE and Samsung Electronics. GE due to the sale of its biopharma business which has eased balance sheet fears and memory stock Samsung Electronics where the market began to look through a trough in memory prices gaining comfort on the prospect of a second half recovery. Our Chinese domestic exposures, and a good example here is Ping'an Insurance, they've contributed uh, to performance on stronger economic outlook thanks to stimulus. And our software incumbent cluster, such as Microsoft and Cisco, reported strong results confirming the IT spending story and a favourable product cycle. The next question is, is what are the risks that are building in the market now? One of the consequences of the post-GFC era has been a rise in populism and geopolitical instability. Now the root cause of this has been widening wealth differentials. Economic policy has been outsourced to central banks who have relied on QE, which has stimulated asset prices but not activity, and so the wealthy have become wealthier. We are also seeing a broad deterioration in corporate credit. The stock of outstanding debt but particularly the growth in non-investment grade credit, which is that light blue stack in the chart here. This is a concern. Average leverage ratios are high relative to a recent Goldilocks combination of low interest rates, historically tight credit spreads and elevated profit margins. Worryingly, the growth in lower quality debt has occurred in weaker businesses, which are increasingly under the threat of disruption. These companies have used a low interest rate environment to take on debt but have used that debt to buy back stock and pay dividends rather than invest in their own businesses. A major part of investing is accepting that we can't know everything but populism does make the environment a little trickier to navigate. As humans we reliably misjudge the likelihood and the impact of rare events like credit crises or trade wars or political upheaval. But as we can see from the Jenga tower on our screen here, we might not be able to predict the precise point of collapse or where the pieces may fall, but we can observe building fragility. So it is important to remember that while volatility may have gone away for now in the context of the market is not worrying about it, and the market is choosing to ignore risks like populism and credit excesses, the price action in the fourth quarter is a good reminder of what can happen when these risks do come to the fore. This next slide gives us an excellent snapshot of where the market is today. So as mentioned earlier, the market is crowding into growth or quality at any price. Now what we can see on this chart here is this blue line. Now this blue line is the measure of the valuation of the most profitable stocks in the market relative to the least profitable. So what you can see here is a quality bubble and it's now approaching a two standard deviation event and we are about to breach the previous peak which was the tech burn. 
So while this crowding can continue, the point is, is that when it ends, it will have a very volatile outcome given the degree of concentration of investments. Heat map is another way of looking at crowding in the market, but at the sector level. So the orange and red squares show those parts of the market that are expensive relative to their long-term history. These sectors are staples, software, healthcare. They're big, liquid, defensive. They're global businesses. Now many of you will have seen our heat map before and you'll notice that these orange and red squares have become more intense. That is, they've become more expensive. This is our heat map from the last quarter. The market is crowding here to avoid geopolitical risk. That is to avoid an exposure to any one single macro. Now the blue squares on the other side of our heat map are those parts of the market that are cheap relative to their long-term history. They are predominantly domestic facing businesses like banks, property, telcos, retail. Note that the outline here is the domestic facing businesses in the US, so that's that top line there. They are not only expensive relative to their own 20 year history, but they are also around 30% more expensive relative to the same businesses listed elsewhere in the world. So why is this the case? Well, the US has already stimulated, and secondly, Concerns around disruption have already been priced into domestic facing businesses listed everywhere else in the world except the US. Now with this as our backdrop, where do we go from here? At Antipodes we have a more constructive view on China as the effects of stimulus are starting to show up in the data such as the manufacturing data, property prices and consumption. China's recent stimulus is much more controlled than China's big bang stimulus of the past and we think this is a good thing. China will continue on its pathway towards rebalancing and it will be a stop-start process. So yes, conditions are looser in China for now, but we are cognizant that conditions may tighten again in another 12 months. Now turning towards Europe. Growth in Europe will remain dependent upon the economic performance of China and the US unless the member states embrace fiscal stimulus. The weaker Euro and the recovery in China should stimulate the export sector in Europe. So we think this can be a catch-up trade. And on top of this, European businesses are priced at incredibly attractive levels. Now finally to the US. One pocket of the domestic US market which we think exhibits value is the housing market. A fall in mortgage rates in the US should lead to a rebound in new housing starts where we see pent-up demand. So starts are running around 20% lower than where they have typically run given where we are in the cycle and excess supply post the GFC has been worked off. Now where we have added quality to our portfolio but at the right price is our software incumbent cluster. Three years ago the market became concerned as to whether these incumbent software businesses could transition from their traditional on-premise license based delivery model to a subscription based cloud model. So when we fast forward today this has largely occurred and it's been led by Microsoft. So where does that leave us now? Cloud has effectively lowered the barriers to entry and increased competition in software based businesses. Now on top of this, the low interest rate environment has facilitated VC funding boom into software, so further increasing competition. And yet these assets are highly sought after by the market. But the question we're asking is, is how many of them will stand the test of time? Now the chart's on your screen, let's start with the chart on the left. This shows the R&D spend of 10 of the largest software incumbents and it's two times that of the sales of the leading SaaS disruptors. And while the disruptors are growing very quickly, it's actually our software incumbents that are adding incremental sales at six times the rate of our disruptors. So what the market is overlooking here is the scale that incumbency offers. And it's not just scale that makes these businesses attractive. It's the networking benefits that they've built inside their business models that reinforce the customer lock. So yes, our disruptors have grown quickly, but we question the sustainability of this growth. So let's take some examples. As a corporate, why would I pay for a Dropbox subscription when I get OneNote as part of my Office 365 package? And why do I need to pay for LogMeIn, which is just a conferencing product, when I could get Skype for Business as part of my Office 365 package? So what you can see here is that these disruptors are largely single feature offerings and they're being replicated by the big platforms. But worse, the platforms are giving these services away for free. 
So we fail to see the customer lock that these businesses have. And without a customer lock, you have a weak business model. But despite all this, the market is pricing our disruptors to perfection and is prepared to pay three times the price for our incumbents. So in Antipodes, we see this as a classic long short opportunity. So while the market is prepared to pay any price for growth, the question remains how to balance increasingly attractive valuations of cyclical stocks with risks regarding the durability of the cycle. So the US is unlikely to accelerate much from here, but we think the stabilisation in China should sustain global growth at current levels for longer. So what are we doing? We are adding growth to the portfolio, but we are looking for it in less obvious parts of the market. We are also adding cheaper, more cyclical growth opportunities, but we are adding cyclicals that are hiding a structural growth story. And it's important to labour that point. The cyclicals that we are adding do have a structural story behind them. We are not buying them just because they're cheap stocks. So if we look at our diversified alpha, alpha clusters, which shows us a snapshot of the portfolio of where it is today. So where have we been adding? So we've been adding in our global cyclicals cluster. So we've been adding to our conglomerates GE and Siemens, and we've been adding to auto component companies such as Continental and Vallejo, which are enablers of autonomous driving. So these are all examples of cyclical stocks hiding a structural growth story. We've also been adding to our consumer incumbent cluster. We've recently added Sony to the portfolio. Another structural growth story found in one of the world's strongest content portfolios across gaming, music, video and high-end image sensors for cameras. And we were able to purchase this stock on less than 10 times forward earnings. We've also added to our online services cluster. We took advantage of the market's concern around regulation to begin building a position in Facebook last December. Our view is that regulation ultimately lifts the barriers to entry. And concerns seem overstated relative to the evidence of monetization of new ad platforms and e-commerce opportunities. Again, this is a good example of where we have recently added growth to the portfolio, but we've added it at the right price. So we purchased this stock when it was trading on a high teens multiple with the revenue growing at 20%. We've also added to our connectivity cluster via Qualcomm, which is a stock that's been in the portfolio for quite some time. Qualcomm is a company which is a leader in 5G technology and a direct beneficiary of the world we're moving towards where everything will be connected. So with that, I'm happy to open up the line towards Q&A. Fantastic, Alison. And look, always great to hear Antipodes' view on the world of global equity investing and certainly appreciate you taking the time to take investors through the recent attribution uh, from the Antipodes Fund. Just a couple of quick takeouts, Alison. I was scribbling down some of the notes um, in terms of clients uh, taking out some of the important points. And I think it's fascinating to hear your views on the crowding into the global, uh, into quality growth bubble uh, due to geopolitics. Some of the other things I took out of the today's presentation was the fact that Antipodes adding to growth and global cyclicals, but global cyclical stocks that have a, a, a global growth profile but importantly adding to growth at the right price. And Antipodes also mentioned the fact that um, the US looked expensive across the board, but especially in domestic sectors whereby they can pick up similar stocks in either developed Asia or Europe at, um, at half the price. So we will open up to questions and we have had a number come in, Alison. So let's kick off with um, one of the more macro questions. If, if the US-China trade war persisted, how would the Asian overweight exposure in the portfolio be expected to perform? Look, I think, you know, the trade war is definitely a tail risk and, and, and you know, we, we refer to a series of tail risks in our presentation and the trade war is one of that. So a negative outcome on the trade war would be broadly negative for markets. So what we have done in the portfolio is we've taken out a series of positions which manage, uh, which manage against negative events like these. So, but with that in mind, you're right, half of, our, half of our Asian exposure is in global businesses and it would be businesses like Samsung Electronics and Komatsu. So now, so these businesses aren't Chinese businesses and they're not dependent on demand from the US. I mean, they are truly global businesses. Now the other half of our Asian exposure business is the more, more domestic facing businesses and they are predominantly in China. 
So a negative outcome to trade wars would likely hurt SMEs, which, were, which would have negative implications for the domestic Chinese economy, as SMEs do drive a lot of activity. But the domestic businesses we typically own have a structural growth story. So Ping An is a great example of that. So we believe that we've picked the higher quality businesses, which should ultimately hold us in good stead uh, for the long term, and particularly in a relative sense. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions while we're talking China on the uh, Chinese internet so stocks. And I'll combine a couple of questions here. Looks like Antipodes has reduced their Chinese inter internet stocks. Why is this so? There's another question specifically on Baidu um, with respect to uh, the stock um, being down and hasn't rebounded. So sure. if you can cover off on, sure. on the Chinese internet stocks. Sure. Um, you know, good questions. Look, in, with regards to Chinese internet, we didn't pick up uh, we didn't pick up early enough the changes that were happening in this space, and this is particularly relevant to Baidu as well. So, you know, what we didn't sort of pick up on, well, what we didn't put enough emphasis on, was the capital flowing into internet, and um, that was funded by really by Alibaba and Tencent. And you know, to give some context, you know, the VC that's coming out of Shenzhen. Uh, is of almost the same size as, as that coming out of the Silicon Valley. Now, in the Silicon Valley, it's going into software businesses, but in China, it's going into internet businesses. So, in that regard, we didn't pick up, you know, the change that was happening in this space. So, what's happened is, is that Alibaba and Tencent have spent a lot of money uh, to keep users inside their platforms. And so, you know, with Baba, we have the e-commerce, and with Tencent, we have WeChat. So, as as users go into these these super apps. Um, Barber and Tencent have, have built these walled gardens to allow you to, to, to search within these platforms. So sort of reducing the, um, if for a better word, importance of, of Baidu. So by organising everything within Barber or by organising everything within WeChat, you never have to leave it. So what ends up happening was, was Baidu had a lot to spend in order to compete. And we thought this was transitory and we also thought we had margin of safety. But you know, in terms of you know, reassessing the case, it looks like the spending will be more permanent and this lower margin structure you know, will, will be more permanent. And so with that in mind, we, you know, we significantly resize this position. Okay, and that, look, that covers off another question just in terms of you know, um, any mistakes that we've made and we've learned yeah. over the year and I think um, that, that's probably yeah, a good example that of that. a good example of one of them, yeah. Um, Alison, just turning outside of China now um, in terms of the US, is there any value uh, in the GE business outside of its healthcare or, or aero businesses and it's a large position in the portfolio? Sure, sure. So look, the, the key, the, you know, the key gem in, in GE, you know, really is the, the aerospace business. Um, you know, it has, it has 70% market, and, and it's the engine business, so it has a 70% market share of narrow body planes and a 50% market share of wide body planes. And really, this is a fantastic business. So while you give the engine away for free up front, you know, what you get in return is a 20 to 30 year, you know, parts and servicing a, a contract, which is highly profitable. Now, you know, we have the healthcare business, which, um, which you know, the question mentions, but the remaining business, you know, is the power business. Now, the market's view on the, and this is utility scale gas turbines. Now, the market's view on the power business is that it is in, it's in a structural decline. Now, our view is, is not that. Now, our view is it's more in a cyclical downturn. So when we think about the world, the, the world is, is becoming greener. So we would expect in the future, uh, you know, much less power to be generated from coal. Now, what are the alternatives, and, and particularly for baseload power? You know, gas is a genuine alternative. So that sort of speaks to why we see this industry as being in a cyclical downturn. Um, you know, there, are, there is evidence of the participa participants, and it is a fairly consolidated market, the participants starting to act in a, in a more rational way relative to before with regards to pricing. Um, so, you know, we, we do see that there is value in this in the power business, and certainly the market has has completely given up on it. So, so that would be how you know we do think that is a, a lead to the story as well. Yeah, and I, I noticed it was one of the larger outperformers in uh, Q1 this year. Absolutely. I mean, look, that that's sort of a classic example of you know GE has a significant amount of, of debt in this business, and while we're always aware of that, we did misjudge the sensitivity. Um, uh, uh, the market sensitivity towards the debt, and so uh, you know, perhaps in talking about mistakes made last year, you know, we probably should have tempered our enthusiasm for buying GE because it got cheaper towards the end of the year. 
Uh, but having said that, when the market became concerned about credit, you know, GE was certainly cast aside. And, and we revisited this case, as we do with all our stocks, which, which um, suffer a significant setback. We reassess the thesis to make sure it's intact and we haven't missed anything. And we still remain committed to the story. Um, we purchased more of this. And as we can see, um, you know, what we really liked about this business was the fact that we could see that the company realised it was an issue and so it was selling its assets. So in the first quarter when it sold off its biopharma business, you know, the market has, and the market has become less concerned about credit, but it's seen that this asset sales will help reduce the balance sheet. So we think the balance sheet will look quite different uh, for this company in a year's time. And, 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 you know, yes, as you said, market has been a top contributor this quarter. Mm -hmm. Okay, turning a little bit back to Asia, a uh, question here on Korean Telecom, KT, which we have spoken about in previous webinars. How has it performed recently? Because it was touted as one of the, the top stock picks uh, during 2018. Sure. Uh, KT had a solid, solid um, performance, and in stock-wise performance in the fourth quarter. It was a solid contributor to the portfolio. And this was when, you know, if we think about what's happening in the fourth quarter, you know, volatility emerged. And, and so the market began to rotate into the quality defences. And so, so KT had a, you know, had a good, had a, had a good uh, performance in fourth quarter. Now, conversely, turning into the third quarter and what, what we know about what's happened in markets, you know, in this, in this last uh, January to March, you know, KT really has fallen victim to the market's preference for growth. And so while the company itself is delivering um, and it has increased its dividends, so in terms of the company, you know, where all the signals that we are getting are the right signals, um, you know, this stock particularly has fallen victim to the rotation back into quality at any price. And so it has been a laggard for us this quarter. Right. We do have time, I think, for one more question, which I'll, I'll, I'll select here. Um, we spoke a little bit about it in the presentation. Are old tech stocks like Microsoft and Cisco still key holdings and, and how have they performed? Sure. I mean, these are stocks that have been in the portfolio for some time. They've been, been large positions in the portfolio for some time. And we, we still see that this story is, these stories uh, you know, for Microsoft and Cisco, they're, they're still very much playing out. So certainly um, you know, what we can see with, with Microsoft uh, and its cloud, you know, the cloud businesses uh, it is growing incredibly quickly. Uh, it, it is the genuine competitor to, to AWS being um, Amazon Web Services. And particularly it's starting to pick up more sales than what Amazon is. So where Amazon had, had sort of the edge was in, in, new, in new cloud businesses. And where Microsoft is having the edge now is traditional businesses moving into the cloud. And, and this is where Microsoft already has a, um, you know, a, a competitive edge because it's got, it's got the relationship with the customer. So we're seeing the, the cloud business still growing at a very fast clip and the profitability of this business is now at, at the corporate level. So you know, we, we see this story still playing out for some time. And Cisco again, you know, um, when the market was starting to obsess about this, you know, the, the cloud destroying you know, uh, the need to have any kind of um, on-premise um, on data management. And, and of course that hasn't been the case at all we're in a hybrid environment. So, Cisco still we see legs to the story in terms of the product cycle. So very happy to own these stocks and, and you know, we, we, add, we add to them when the price is right and I think they'll be in the portfolio still for some time. Fantastic. Look, Alison, we will wrap up things now as we have run out of time. We have had a, a huge amount of attendance today and a huge amount of questions. So if we haven't got to your questions, we will certainly uh, come back to you uh, offline. We will be making the Antipodes available on replay on the Antipodes website later today. Um, so that website is www.antipodespartners.com. We certainly would like to thank everyone for their participation today. If you have any further inquiries, please do not hesitate to contact the Antipodes website. We certainly thank you for your time and wish you a very nice day. Thank you very much.